city projection of what interest rates are going to look like uh, uh, in this country. Uh, it's just a forecast in the city, but it was absolutely eye-watering. The other thing that really strikes you is the way that uh, Liz Truss's government is behaving like a new government with its own mandate from the people for a, a bold new direction of travel. But that's not what uh, Liz Truss uh, got there on. She's there uh, because of a Conservative uh, leadership contest. She didn't get that many MPs in the first round uh, of backing her. And an awful lot of Tory MPs are going round and using words like reckless and madness today. Uh, one of them actually uh, joked to me that uh, there might be letters going in demanding a, a, a no-confidence vote. I think they were joking. It wasn't entirely clear. We now have new battle lines in politics that will define uh, the battles at the party conference and beyond. And we are in the early hours of a big new economic experiment in this country. They termed it a mini-budget. But it was a gigantic change of direction. Is your plan a gamble? Kwasi Kwarteng announced the biggest tax cutting package since 1972, funded by borrowing at a time of high inflation. Chancellor! Thank you, thank you. Kwasi Kwarteng, just over two weeks in the job, was cheered by opposition MPs as he declared this Conservative government was going to do things differently from its predecessors. Mr. Speaker, we are at the beginning of a new era, and as we contemplate, and as we contemplate, that's right, that's right, a new era, a new era, a new era, and as we contemplate, and as we contemplate this new era, we recognise, we recognise, Mr. Speaker, that there is huge potential in our country. He confirmed the government would implement Liz Truss's leadership campaign pledges to reverse the national insurance rise and cancel the corporation tax rise. And then he added a surprise new tax cut for top earners. I have another measure, Mr Speaker. I have another measure. High tax rates damage Britain's competitiveness. Take the additional rate of income tax. At 45%, it is currently higher than the headline top rate in G7 countries like the US and Italy. But I'm not going to cut the additional rate of tax today, Mr Speaker. I'm going to abolish it altogether. Yeah. From April the 23rd, we will have a, high, a single higher rate of income tax of 40%. Put together the government's tax cuts and someone on £20,000 a year salary will gain £157. Someone earning £200,000 a year will gain 5220 Someone on a million a year will be £55,000 better off. For too long in this country, we've indulged in a fight over redistribution. Yeah. Now we need to focus on growth, not just how we tax and spend. We won't apologise for managing the economy in a way that increases prosperity and living standards. Our entire focus is on making Britain more globally competitive, not losing out to our competitors abroad. Some Tory MPs cheered the reversals of policies they'd only recently voted for. Labour said it was all evidence of Tory failure. Can I thank the Chancellor on his comprehensive demolition of the record of the last 12 years? Yeah. Their record, their failure, their vicious circle of stagnation. Yeah. Early this morning, ahead of the Chancellor's statement, the pound was already falling against the dollar, based on what the markets knew was coming. As the Chancellor delivered his statement, with surprise extra tax cuts funded by borrowing, the pound fell even more. Quasi Kwarteng was asked what he made of the market's judgment on his announcement. The, market, uh, the markets uh, uh, react as they will, but the, gro but the growth plan, the growth plan will uh, very soon show, show that we're on the right course. The Chancellor said that the budget would have an immediate impact on the economy of this country. The 1972 budget by Tory Chancellor Anthony Barber is the only comparable tax giveaway on record, a dash for growth which soon fed inflation and brought economic pain. We have decided 
on the biggest ever cut in spending by the government and by local councils. It was essentially a demand sort of pump priming experiment. This is the opposite of that. What we're trying to do is to create incentives and also look at supply side reform. It's a completely different uh, model. The government's promising wave after wave of deregulation reforms, tightening laws around strike action, planning relaxations for enterprise zones. But some think they may struggle to get this economic experiment off the ground. I would expect it to end in a sterling crisis, that the exchange rate will fall and the Bank of England will be obliged to put up interest rates to address the fall in sterling. How quickly could things go badly wrong? Well, it's not easy to predict. I'd be surprised if you know, we go on more than six months without quite a lot of trouble. A sterling crisis in, within six months? Well, you could argue that it's happening already. The new Chancellor, the new Prime Minister, if they were sitting here, might say, you're just typical of Treasury orthodoxy, old-fashioned thinking. Yes. Well, of course, they'd be right. I am describing old-fashioned thinking, but it's lasted for a reason. And the reason is that uh, you know, when alternatives have been tried, spending in the hope that income will rise, they haven't worked. Liz, we have to be honest. We have to honest? be honest. But borrowing your way out of inflation isn't a plan. It's a fairy tale. Rishi Sunak didn't turn up to repeat that attack today, but plenty of his former supporters are doing so privately. Maria, hi. The size of their giveaway shocked some Tory MPs as much as it did the markets. The government needs both on side, but early proof of policy success could be hard to come by. Gary Gibbon, and this was the reaction from the Lib Dems and the SNP. This is a Conservative government totally out of touch with the needs of the British people. They either don't get it or don't care that people are seeing soaring bills on their energy, on their food, on their mortgages. This isn't the economic plan that Britain needs. It appears they don't have a plan. The Chancellor comes here today, the sixth Chancellor in seven years, asking us to believe that the things that he voted for and supported just a few months ago were all fine at the time, but need completely reversed now. A new era, but they've been in government for 12 years. He stretches credibility beyond breaking point. Best for growth, the Chancellor outlined a plan to introduce new low-tax investment zones. Our policy correspondent Paul McNamara is in Liverpool, one of 38 areas, already in discussions with the government. Um, so, Paul, what are these investment zones? Are they any different to enterprise zones? And does Liverpool want them? Well, broadly, business groups have been positive about them, not least on a day that's seen the value of the pound tanking. So, frankly, anything that might boost investment is welcome. Sorry about that. There's actually a very loud ship behind me that's tooting its horns at the moment. Look, I'm not sure how quickly these investment zones will be popping up. The idea is that each investment zone will be able to offer their own tax breaks, business rate relief, national cuts to national insurance. And the idea is this will drive investment. There are 38 regions that the government is in discussion with. Liverpool City region is one of them. Talking to lots of local authorities though, it's very much in discussion stage. One telling me that their talks were in their infancy. We're expecting later announcement from the Department of Leveling Up because of course this will be seen as some way to drive that levelling up. But in order to get all this through, the government will include reforms to environmental regulation and local planning policies. Policies and regulation, which the environmental lobby say have been hard fought for. And today, these groups almost universally have been in condemnation about what might be coming. At this point, to undo that regulation in one of the worst places in Europe for wildlife and na natural populations and habitats is absolutely unthinkable. We have targets set for 2030 to halt the decline in our biodiversity, indeed in some cases to even begin to improve and restore it. And we are never, ever going to get anywhere near that if we undo this very valuable protection. This is a significant and very, very worrying step backwards. Well, the financial markets have given what you might euphemistically call a negative reaction to the Chancellor's speech. Our economics reporter, Neil MacDonald, is here. I mean, they went bonkers, didn't they? How bad was it? Well, just as the Chancellor was announcing a very big increase in government borrowing, there was also a very big increase in the cost of government borrowing, and that is clearly a dangerous combination. So the, the government wants to cut taxes to boost economic growth. 
and the plan is to finance those tax cuts by borrowing money. So it needs the financial markets to play ball and lend it that money. And there's obviously a question mark about at what price they will do that. And what we saw today was a really quite dramatic spike in the interest rate that those markets were demanding on government borrowing. So back in January, the government could borrow for five years at an interest rate below 1%. You can see it goes up to August, it's about 1.5%. And then in the last few weeks, it has really shot up and today spiked at 4.1%. And if you look at the way things played out during today, you can see that after Kwasi Kwarteng spoke, um, interest rates went up by about half a point. Now, interest rates have been going up worldwide this year. But I think if you look at that pattern, it's very hard to explain that on events happening elsewhere. And that is a pretty harsh initial verdict on the Chancellor's first budget. Right, so why? Why do investors on the markets dislike this? It's not the borrowing that's going to be used to freeze all our energy bills, because at least in theory, that should be temporary. The problem is that the government has added on top of that a lot of permanent, very big tax cuts. And there is a question about whether that puts our public finances on an unsustainable path. So back in March, the last official forecast for government debt, total government debt as a share of our national income, you see it going up to about 85% of national income and then falling away. Now, the IFS says that this is where it is going with quasi Quarting's tax cuts. And you and the viewers can see that that line is heading in one direction. And of course, investors can see exactly the same line. And their question is, is there any real plan from the Chancellor that will bring that line back down? And the government just says it'll be paid for from growth? Yes. And it is true that, of course, there should be an initial boost to growth this winter because the government has headed off the increase in people's uh, bills. I think the problem the government has got is that a lot of these ideas it's talking about, like, you know, enterprise zones, it's very hard to put any sort of cash number on how that's going to boost economic growth because the details are just not there. So you can sit down and work out pretty directly the cost of all these tax cuts, whether the faster growth is ever going to turn up to cover them. There's just not the hard numbers there to prove that one way or the other. Thanks, Neil. Well, earlier I spoke to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Chris Philp, and I began by showing him a graph which showed sterling dropping in reaction to the statement. This is what you tweeted re immediately after the budget finished. We're great to see sterling strengthening on the back of the new UK growth plan because for a moment sterling went up a little bit and since then it's plummeted. Yeah, there's been a slight move in sterling but this is a long-term plan and the Chancellor will be setting out uh, his medium-term fiscal plan which will explain how debt over GDP will fall over the medium term and it's worth just repeating that we do have the second lowest debt to GDP ratio of any G7 country. But the so, markets so who, who, to whom you have to sell this debt are spooked. I mean, Paul Johnson at the IFS says, today the Chancellor announced the biggest package of tax cuts in 50 years without even a semblance of an effort to make the public finance numbers add up. Instead, the plan seems to be to borrow large sums at increasingly expensive rates, put government debt on an unsustainable rising path, and hope we get better growth. No, well, I don't accept that characterisation. There's a couple of points I would make. First of all, this is a growth plan designed to get our economy moving. It contains tax cuts, which are important because they, because taxes that are too high stymie growth. But it contains other measures as well. It contains measures to reduce regulation. It contains measures to invest in infrastructure. I would also just say on the growth point, if we are successful, which we think we will be, in elevating growth above what it would otherwise be, that generates, over by the fifth year, if we get 1% more growth, £47 billion of additional So tax where is income. that growth coming from? That's the key, because what makes you think that businesses who are getting tax cuts now, but facing rising labour costs, rising energy costs, so it's not like they have any more money, it's just that they're not losing as much money, are suddenly going to have money to invest well, Hang on, we've seen, we've seen, we've seen, Christian, we've seen organisations like the CBI today strongly welcome this package. You show me a single business that thinks putting up their taxes from 19% to 25% course, is a good idea the growth coming like from? this. You're claiming you're going to get 1% growth. Where's the growth coming from? It's not a hope, it's a plan which has been laid out in some detail. We're talking about, you know, revitalising our financial services sector that has historically been 
uh, very strong. We're talking about investing in infrastructure. Why do you think business is going to have money to invest? That's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, you, you, you give with one hand and you take away with the other because they're going to have rising borrowing costs, rising energy costs, rising labour costs because there's a massive labour shortage. You're not doing anything about that. Well, we're going to have people with high levels of skill uh, who will command high wages are welcome to come. Where there are lower skilled jobs you know, and, and there are shortages, we either want to see companies investing in technology and automation and, hand in hand with that, we want to see the people who are less economically active uh, than they could be getting back into the labour market. The Bank of England is going to have to put up interest rates. That means higher borrowing costs, mortgages, rent. But for what 20 doing... years, government and the Bank of England have worked in tandem to try and keep inflation low and growth sustainable. Now you are pulling in opposite directions. No, the Bank of England are doing their job responding to a global inflation challenge. They're trying what to the slow government... demand and you're trying to boost it. No, what this we're... makes no sense no, to No, 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 no. We're not trying to boost demand. What we're trying to do is the, the, the different to that. The objective of this you're plan is not... You're more money to spend. The objective of the plan isn't boosting demand. It's stimulating genuine economic growth. This is not about stimulating consumption. This is about incentivising and enabling well, the, But the bank makes clear that it does stimulate. It is inflationary. Well, look, my, my view is that the inflationary phenomena we're seeing, uh, not just in this country, but around the Western world, is, is partly a monetary phenomenon, it's partly a reaction to the war in Ukraine, it's partly a reaction to things like a surge in post-COVID demand, it's partly due to disruptions to supply chains, particularly in China. I don't think, my personal view, is that I don't think uh, the tax measures uh, announced today are going to significantly, or even at all, add to the inflationary pressures. What about fairness? How is it fair for the very rich to get a massive disproportionate tax cut? £55,000 if you earn a million pounds a year. If you're a CEO on a million pounds, you get £55,000 back in this tax cut, while the cleaner cleaning your business gets virtually nothing. Well, don't, don't forget, how, how is that moral? Well, I, I, just, I just don't forget, those highest 1% of earners are already paying about 28% of all income tax. Uh, you're also forgetting, if I may say, all the other measures that have been introduced. I mean, the £37 billion intervention for energy, uh, there was £400 for everybody, but the 8 million people on lower incomes got an extra £650. Are you saying it's fair? People on lower incomes now pay not only almost no income tax, but also almost no national insurance. And when you look at this package together, yes, it is fair because everyone's getting help, everyone's getting a tax reduction. Looked at together, this is a fair package. But the most important thing is that we're not being sort of driven by the kind of politics of envy. We want an aspirational country where everyone uh, wants to work hard, get ahead, keep a bit more of their own money. And if our economy grows, and this whole plan is orientated around growth, we will see higher wages, we'll see more jobs, and we'll see a higher tax yield that will pay for public services like education, police, and schools. Growth is at the heart of our vision, and that is what today's carefully thought out plan is designed to deliver. Chris Felt, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, joining me now is the Shadow Chancellor at Labour's Rachel Reeves. How do you know this won't work? Well, let's just look at the verdict of financial markets uh, today. We've seen the pound fall to its lowest level in 37 years, the costs of government borrowing rise, indeed the costs of borrowing for, for everybody uh, increasing. So a family with a mortgage, a business looking to invest, the costs for everybody are going up. And that's because the package today of uh, entirely unfunded uh, tax cuts uh, gives markets much room for concern. And that's why well, well, maybe I they're believe listening the package to you. is reckless. I mean, are you not in danger of talking Britain down? I mean, the markets are just investors at the end of the day who watch the news. If, if I was to have such power, the markets are coming to their own judgments uh, based on the package of measures today. Uh, Larry Summers, the former US uh, Treasury Secretary, has also said today that he can't think of a country in the developed world that has got a less sensible macroeconomic uh, policy. OK, and so what would you do? That's the question. I mean, would you stay in lockstep with the Bank of England um, and not introduce any tax cuts, any kind of stimulus to get growth. You well, just let us stay in recession. Uh, uh, clearly not, Christian. And we have been saying for, for months that the government needed to do more to help people with their energy bills. But this government, now that they have introduced a price cap, are doing it all through borrowing. And we are saying that the energy companies that are making huge windfall profits because of the uh, exponential increase in uh, oil and gas prices, that they yeah. should pay more We, we talked about in, that in a tax. lot. I mean, I'm talking well, about what would you do for growth, not, well, not the energy... Plan. I mean, we, we've yeah, said no, many 
sometimes you would mm, tax the, yeah, no. the energy well, companies. It is, it is an important point because the economy does need support and people need help with the cost of living but crisis. that's not going to bring the question, growth. Well, the question is how you pay for these things. And if you pay for things all through borrowing, that is what puts pressure on financial markets, on sterling and borrowing uh, costs. But let's take some other measures. Uh, I've argued that instead of cutting corporation tax uh, for the, the, the largest and most profitable bi businesses, a government should be instead uh, uh, expanding investment allowances to help businesses that are genuinely making investments to improve productivity and growth rates. And that also we should reform the, for the system of business rates to help our small businesses and our high street businesses uh, to thrive. That is the way to get economic prosperity and growth in all parts of the country, rather than the trickle-down approach uh, that this government are pursuing, which frankly just will not work. The, all the evidence is that trickle-down doesn't work. You're going to have to go into the next election, though, aren't you, saying you'll have to raise taxes? That's going to be the question you asked every, at every stage. You're going to have to put up taxes. You're going to have to say yes, because it's either that or cut public services. Well, remember, Krishnan, that the Tories have increased taxes 15 times in the last two years, which is why the tax burden was at an all-time uh, high. So, look, we welcome the reversal, for example, of the national insurance contribution uh, increase, but we think that taxes should be fair. And, and that means uh, uh, asking those with the broadest uh, shoulders to pay a bit more so of the burden. So you'd put the 45% tax back? Up, wouldn't you? Well, I don't know if the 45% tax cut is going to go through because I've spoken to many Conservative MPs this afternoon who are staggered that this is the priority of the government and that has to come to a vote in the House of Commons and we will fight tooth and claw to stop that tax cut from going ahead because as, as you said in your previous interview with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, for someone earning a million pounds, that is a tax cut of £50,000, more than a nurse earns during the course of the year and it really does stick in the throat when people Rachel are facing Reece. a cost of living crisis just to prioritise those of the highest incomes. Shadow Chancellor, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this government is on the side of the British people, according to the Chancellor. It depends on which British people he's talking about, perhaps. For those struggling at the very bottom, it may be hard to think this is a budget with them in mind. For people on low incomes, a cut in basic rate tax offers relatively little. And to those on benefits, their budget dividend, a threat of sanctions if they don't work harder to get back into work. Our social affairs editor, Jackie Long, reports from Hastings, one of the most deprived areas in the country. On the seafront, the weather is deceptively warm for autumn, but everyone still knows what's coming. And this year, more than any other, there's real concern, fear even, about what the winter will bring. We are really on a deadline. We're talking first cold snap, at a local community centre, a winter readiness meeting. Led by Hastings Heart, it's a coalition of voluntary groups and charities with one issue on the agenda. Basic needs um, that we want to cover, we're talking about heating, lighting, food. There is an urgency here, but a familiarity also. These groups work together during the COVID pandemic and say this crisis is as alarming. Are we yet picking up that vibe that People have realised this is on that same level. 72-year-old Carol lost her husband in the middle of lockdown. After nearly 50 years of marriage, she's been left grief-stricken, struggling to cope. The cost of living crisis, a new problem to tackle alone. My, my basic pension doesn't even cover the fuel bill. It's £100 pounds short of the fuel bill alone, which leaves me nothing to live on. So if I don't have my savings, I don't know what I'd do. She benefits from previous government support, but nothing from today will relieve the almost paralysing fear she feels. I'm living in one room, and I don't understand it. I've got one gas fire, I don't use the central heating, and it's frightening, it's frightening. I don't think about things anymore. I don't, I don't have expectations, or I don't know if that's bereavement or reaction. Reality, I don't know what it is. At 10 with the BBC News for Sussex, I'm Emily Jeffrey. The Chancellor quasi. This government is on the side of the British people. Yeah. That question of sides, whose side the government is on, answered for some by the jarring laying down of two new measures side by side, lifting the cap on bankers' bonuses 
and threatening to cut benefits for some claimants. Grandmother Julie Main says this is a budget for people who are already OK. Nothing to help her deal with her rising debt to her energy company. Just the threat of sanctioning the benefits she can barely live on now. The tax is going to help some people that have already got a lot of money. <laughs> um, but it's not going to help people that haven't got a lot of money, is it? And on the banker's bonuses, she would laugh if she didn't feel like crying. I think lifting caps on anything at the moment is making people like ourselves just feel a bit worse, to be quite honest, because you're lifting a cap on some people that have already got enough money. So the weather has turned, but what else changes for people after today? This cost of living crisis can often feel like something new, a catastrophe born out of this particular moment in time. But for many people here, that sense of crisis is just a fact of life. Levels of deprivation have risen significantly over the past decade. Layer on top of that soaring inflation and rising energy prices. And the help people need goes way beyond one budget, mini or otherwise. Things like your scarf, things like your hot water bottles, things like your blankets. For all the talk of growth at Westminster, back at the community centre, they're pulling together the absolute basics to help people survive the winter. As well as these winter warm packs, they'll be looking at creating warm spaces, places people can come to, to literally try and stay warm. For the co-founder of the charity Hastings Heart, an extraordinary development in one of the richest countries in the world. People never, ever get ahead. They never have much hope. They, they are constantly having to firefight. And I've always maintained it is extremely expensive being poor. It's not trickling down, to coin a phrase. It never has. It never has. A rising tide lifts all boats, so the cliché goes. They need it to be true here and soon, with too many feeling left clinging to the sides and just getting to next spring feels a very long way off. Well, Paul Johnson from the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which is an independent research institute, is with me now. Can you just explain, if everybody who pays tax is getting a tax cut, why is your body saying everybody who earns £155,000 a year will actually be worse off? If they earn less than that, they'll be worse off as a result of the combination of tax changes that have been made over the last year, because um, on top of the cuts we saw today, we are still seeing the point at which you start to pay income tax, the income tax personal allowance, frozen for four years. Well, when inflation is as high as it is, that means that a lot more of your income will be brought into income tax. So for most people, about 99% of income taxpayers, they're still going to be worse off in four years' time as a result of tax changes over this parliament. Now, the, the story tonight seems to be about the market reaction, the pound plummeting, uh, the government uh, guilt rates rising. How much does that matter? It matters in all sorts of ways. So the pound going down matters because it will mean more inflation. It makes our imports, including our energy imports, more expensive. Uh, and guilt rates um, uh, going up matters because it makes borrowing more expensive for the government. In other words, we'll have to pay more tax just to cover the interest on our borrowing. And, of course, there's an awful lot more borrowing going on. We're borrowing an enormous amount this year just to cover the cost of the energy package and... Uh, borrowing is going to be higher in the long run because of these tax cuts. And the government now says, don't worry, it's fine because the economy is going to grow and that's going to produce £47 billion in five years if we get 1% of growth and that will pay for it all. H how will we know whether this is working? Well, that's, uh, the, 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 there's <laughs> lots of elements to that. I mean, in the short run, uh, we'll know what's happening to interest rates and we'll know what's happening, whether this has an impact on inflation in, a, in the wrong direction. In the medium term, we'll be able to see what happens to the economy, but it's always incredibly hard to disentangle what's driving what. Now, if Russia pulls out of Ukraine tomorrow and energy prices fall, then the world economy will do a lot better and so will the UK economy. That won't be down to what the government's done. The government wants growth. We all want growth is a good thing. And there are some good things in this mini budget. Planning reform, uh, for example, stamp duty cuts. These are the sorts of things which actually about long term improvement to the growth potential of the economy. The tax cuts in the short run, they chuck lots of money into the economy that will help growth, but be very bad for inflation in the long run. They might help growth a little, but it's really is 
wishful thinking to think that this in itself will add 1% a year to growth. That's a huge change. And, and you now expect, do you, the Bank of England to put up interest rates? I mean, there's some talk of the need of an emergency bank rate rise. I mean, do you see that? I don't know whether there'll be an emergency one. I'd be quite surprised. But I, clearly, the Bank of England will put interest rates up considerably further from where uh, they are at the moment. And the worry about this particular package is that they will put them up more than they otherwise would have done. They've seen what's happened to sterling. They've seen what's happened to gilt rates. They've seen um, an extra 40-odd billion thrown into the economy. And you just had your conversation with Chris Philp. You're right. The bank has said explicitly they want to damp down demand in order to get inflation under control. Well, 40-odd billion pounds worth of tax cuts are going to increase demand. So there's the, go that the bank has got more to push again. So there's a danger that this actually pushes us deeper into recession? Well, it, it won't, does the exact opposite of what the government I don't wants. think it will push us deeper into recession because there'll be, in the short run, there'll be more money in the economy and it might help in the short run. I think it will hit, push interest rates up. The danger with these big tax cuts in the short run, which help in the short run, is that they can lead to more pain later on, particularly in inflationary environments. And the bank is going to have to push very hard to get that inflation down.